Hi guys, welcome to yet another episode of Vision Language Modeling Series. This is Season 1, Episode 3 and I'm Prithvi. As the title suggests, we're going to look at contrast to pre-training in this episode and apply it for multimodal facial recognition. For those who are tuning in for the first time uh, to this episode, I strongly encourage you to go back and check out our first couple of episodes uh, because you will know that uh, this episode is a departure from the first two because in the first two episodes, we looked at some discriminative tasks and, uh, you know, uh, this is a, a completely a, a, a different kind of episode. And uh, in case if you're wondering uh, why this departure, uh, it's pretty simple guys. I could do four or five uh, episodes on visual question answering in a row and uh, you'd obviously be bored. So I thought I'll switch it up and uh, have some excitement uh, going on for both of us. Right. So with that said, uh, there are plenty of takeaways and there's a lot of ground to cover and uh, let's get started. All right, so let's look at some code. As usual, I'll start with the teaser of the takeaways so you will know what is coming. And uh, in terms of context, there are a lot of different facial tasks. The focus of our uh, particular episode is facial recognition, which basically is to identify whether a face is in the database or not. So in that sense, facial recognition and facial retrieval can be interchangeably used as terminologies. So uh, what we are trying to build here is a model which can do two things, right? Um, uh, multimodal face retrieval and cross-modal face retrieval. That means it can accept uh, a language-based query to, to retrieve uh, images, face images, or it can accept language and a, a combination of language and image queries and retrieve images, right? So that's the uh, larger goal. Uh, why it is important if you look at it, right? Um, as cinematic it sounds, we all are acquainted to the idea of people describing uh, a person verbally, right? Like a verbal description could be the potential suspect is tall, brown hair, wearing glasses, having a goatee and things like that. How do you think uh, or uh, have you ever wondered how do you think a verbal description of a person and then search a database for photographs? That's exactly what we're trying to do. But that's just the uh, tip of the iceberg and there is plenty of takeaways as we move forward. And uh, I'm going to do it slightly differently, guys. There's a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to focus on the key uh, areas uh, which you are uh, better off hearing from me. And the other things which are pretty straightforward, I'm going to leave it out there. You can uh, look at it once you got access to the notebook, right? Uh, let's uh, let's get cracking. The big idea behind contrastive learning is that there are two important things that you know need to understand before getting into contrastive learning are the elements of contrastive learning is metric learning and ranking losses, right? Um, so what is metric learning, right? Um, imagine a learning paradigm that can take random points as shown in the figure, right? And then come up with an embedding space where all the similar points are grouped together and the dissimilar points are separate. This is the big idea behind metric learning. Depending on the kind of network you use, it can be called as deep metric learning or metric learning, right? How does it do? There are two things, right? Uh, in terms of how does it do, it uses a distance base, a distance function. Imagine any of the distance function which you are familiar with, like a Euclidean distance or a Manhattan distance. It uses a distance function as a loss as opposed to conventional loss functions like cross entropy loss to come up with the embedding space that we spoke about, right? And uh, how does it compare uh, the random points that we gave as input? It takes them uh, as pairs and compares and contrasts, hence the name contrastive, right? So it takes uh, two or more uh, points that has been given as an input and then identifies the similarity using the distance loss function and then learns a custom metric function. The idea is to come up with an embedding space where similar points are together using a custom metric. Right? Hence, it is called metric learning. That's the big idea uh, behind contrastive learning. Right? And uh, if you think about, uh, like, uh, we clearly understand why we need discriminative uh, losses and discriminative tasks. But why contrastive learning is required? Which, what kind of task call for contrastive loss? If you think about this, imagine any kind of photos app, either in your smartphones or standalone apps like Google Photos or Picasso. Uh, think about uh, those apps clustering similar faces using supervised uh, tasks like classification. It's kind of hard, right? We don't have limited set of photographs, the ki a limited set of faces. We keep on taking photographs and the number of faces keep on increasing. It's not a uh, limited, it's not a limited set. If you're going to do face facial recognition on a limited set of labels, you can do it as a classification task. It perfectly works and that's what is called as a closed set face recognition, which is shown on the left side of the diagram. The right side of the diagram shows the merits of framing it as a 
a metric learning problem or a contrast learning problem where you get a constant inflow of new faces where it is not practically possible to have limited set of labels hence the idea is to not learn a decision boundary idea is to learn an embedding space that's what the last portion of the diagram shows uh, in terms of the outcome for a classification problem or a metric learning problem and uh, in literature it is called closed set face recognition or open set face recognition because it's open ended right feel free to take a look at the diagram and uh, in terms of uh, i also mentioned about ranking loss the the idea that we have to use a distance function as a loss uh, for metric learning is important for you guys the key takeaway in this section is the terminology is kind of messed up uh, feel free to read this cell to understand what are the different names people use uh, but again the key takeaway is there are two kinds of uh, ways you can use the distance function as loss one is pairwise loss function another is triplet um as the name suggests pair means it looks at two points at a time and then uh, triplets basically looks at three points at a time it's it's pretty self explanatory guys but uh, in terms of exactly how it does and the nuances we'll see as we move forward right uh, otherwise it's pretty straightforward right the next is what is the kind of ranking loss we are interested in this particular session in this particular session we are going to look at a triplet loss as opposed to a pairwise loss uh, for a simple reason triplet loss has been empirically proven to work better than pairwise loss and i'll explain couple of terminologies here as you can see um when you compare pair of points uh, it is customary to establish one baseline point as anchor and then take one uh, take a similar one as positive so what how do we show uh, inputs to the model is to show similar looking points the similar looking pairs are called anchor and positive and the dissimilar looking points are anchor and negative so that terminology you need to know is anchor positive and negative so anchor positive is similar pairs anchor negative is dissimilar pairs on the pairwise learning pairwise ranking class as you can see you give one pair at a time and expect the model to tweak the embedding space using the distance function but in triplet class we pass all the three in one go right the anchor positive negative as you can see in the diagram goes in one go and expect the model to tweak the embedding space right but also in this example you are seeing only unimodal uh, contrast class where image is uh the anchor image is positive and negative right but in our case as you know we are doing vision language it will be multimodal we'll speak about it as we move forward right uh so this basically tells what is in scope and the diagram is important for you guys as is in a single diagram i want to show what we're going to learn uh, what we have what you're going to be doing in the training phase and the inference phase of this exercise right so we're going to take a face image and then we're going to take a attribute which is positive means which exactly matches with the face which is positive and then the attribute which exactly um, you know uh, is away from uh, which is not matching with the image right so th that's how we are going to make the uh, triplet that is anchor positive and negative and feed to the model and let the model learn a custom metric to tweak the embedding space as you can see the embedding space is supposed to have the anchor and positive together and the an anchor and negative should be apart that's the expectation in the training phase right and in the inference phase as i've already shown we should be able to pass a textual query or a combination of image and textual query to retrieve images that's our goal right um this section is pretty self explanatory guys i'm just showing you how you can take the lessons from this episode and apply on different tasks feel free to explore this and uh, important thing that you want to know is uh, i mentioned about ranking loss and different flavors of ranking loss like contrastive loss which looks at pairs and triplet loss which looks at three input elements at a time right there is also a, a, another a kind of another flavor of triplet loss which is a cut above and is and is also uh, empirically proven that works better than a vanilla triplet loss is called multiple negative ranking loss so um now what do i mean by that is if you go back and look at this particular example i've shown a single triplet going into the model right so but for a single anchor and a positive pair how many negatives you have to give there is no uh, such a recommendation in the vanilla triplet loss but what multiple negative ranking loss does is you can pass Uh, for a single uh, anchor positive pair why don't you pass multiple negatives to make multiple triplets so that's what multiple negative ranking loss is about um, sentence transformers rhymers have uh, mentioned uh, many of the sota sentence transformer models are trained using multiple negative ranking loss and obviously it works well even though the recommendation is to use when there is no hard negatives it doesn't hurt to use when you have hard negatives so we are going to also use multiple negative ranking loss in this exercise 
and uh, next imp next uh, logical section is data set guys it's very important uh, looking at any task through a, 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 a active and a competitive data set is very important if you look at task through toy data sets the the lessons may, the takeaways may not be uh, very uh, acute and you may not have very solidified lessons from it so i've taken a very actively researched uh, a hard benchmark called celeb a which is nothing but a uh, photographs of celebrities and it is uh, and i'll also explain when i do the preview of the images i'll also explain why it is a hard benchmark and in terms of coverage and things like that but some ju just to give you some statistics it has got some uh, 10k different identities 200k images individual images and 40 binary attributes it also has uh, got some high quality variants you don't have to deal only with 224 by 224 if you have the hardware and if you can afford it you can go all the way up to 1024 by 1024 i've given the link feel free to download and explore here is the raw data frame of uh, uh, the data set that you get that is uh, the attributes are binary that is one means uh, the attribute is present in a particular image minus one means the attribute is absent uh, you have couple of different ways to frame this problem one is to frame it as a, a tabular data set you keep it as a tabular data set and combine with the image and another way is to convert them as a, a text and then deal it as a vision language uh, task Obviously, since we are in a vision language uh, modeling series, I've converted all the attributes that is minus ones and ones into uh, text uh, based attributes. So we're going to keep it as language and vision. You feel free to look at it, right? Like so uh, uh, all these attributes that are available in this table, have the, the text version is here. There are some facial attributes, facial features, hair and aesthetics and things like that, right? Attractive, smiling, bald, hairstyles, uh, mustache, no beard and uh, shape of the nose and things like there are a bunch of there is there is about a bunch of attributes there's about a 40 attributes which have converted into text here right um, here is the preview of the data set right um, this uh, uh, this particular uh, set of six images shows you the coverage and how hard it is look at the second image on the first row the hair is kind of smudged and also look at i mean it, it has it is an actually an adversarial image right and you can also see the different kinds of hair colors different kinds of uh, facial features uh, racial ethnic uh, ethnic backgrounds and uh, different camera angles and things like that also look at the first image in the second row the 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 face is behind shadows so it's kind of hard uh, when compared to other images to actually read the features so hence it is uh, you don't have to take my words at face value most of the literature uses this data set hence i've, I've gone with this data set um that's the preview the next important step is to understand what is triplet mining right so i've explained to you about ranking loss triplet loss and then going to multiple negative ranking loss and things like that and also we told right we want multiple negatives for a single pair of anchor and positive right now we have to define how should the negative be what is anatomy of negative right so that's what this image is showing here right like if you look at it right uh, there is anchor in red and positive in blue right and then there is something called hard semi hard and easy right so what we are trying to do here is if you have an anchor and a positive of a female celebrity and if you bring a male celebrity's attribute as a negative it is not you actually it is not be challenging the model it, it is kind of easy for the model to discriminate that right if, if if you want the model to actually learn some attributes of the face you have to challenge the model hence you have to come up with uh, negatives which are challenging that means for a female anchor you'll have to come up with uh, another female which are closely related right so let me show you how uh, we have to actually do the triplet mining from the results you can see see the results and you can make up your mind this is the method basically does it it's a pretty straightforward python code i'm not going to go into the code walkthrough for uh, triplet mining instead if you see the results you will get the idea right um, as you can see here right uh, these are four different records for the same image the anchor is same as you can see one dot jpg but if you see there are four different uh, records one is a easy easy negative couple of them are semi hard and one is hard right so the easy is pretty simple random male if, if the current anchor is if the anchor is female bring a random male right and uh, semi hard is if the anchor is female bring a female which is closely related as you can see right these two females are closely related but there will be some small things like for example high cheekbones will be there and uh, you know uh, the rosy cheeks is here but it is not here in the left so you have to bring up some uh, female uh, 
but it is kind of close. This is still semi hard and I'll explain why it is semi hard and why we need hard, right? Uh, look at the last example. Why it is hard is it is not some kind of another female's attribute. What, have, what I've done is taken the positive attribute itself and flipped the couple of things. For example, we have arched eyebrows and I have made it as no arched eyebrows. Just flipped a single attribute and then we have something called wearing earrings and I've made it as not wearing earrings. As you can uh, catch the drift, right? We want to give the triplets in such a way that in a batch the model should have enough things to learn and discriminate. We have to challenge the model, otherwise the embedding space is not going to be tweaked well for that. Right? So that's as far as the data set and how to come up with the uh, triplets is concerned. Right? Uh, next step is important as usual, right? We are going to, we are in the vision language space and we need uh, an encoder for tackling the vision part of the equation and the language part of the equation. The next two steps are going to be coming up with the vision encoder and the language encoder, right? So this particular cell is tells you the, uh, we have a simple class called image encoder which is going to use, which has the flexibility to either use a CNN architecture or a transformer architecture. For CNN I'm using PyTorch TIM and for uh, transformers I'm using obviously Hugging Face. As you can see in the forward, we have, have a nicely conditioned whether it is a CNN or transformer. It is pretty straightforward guys, we are just getting the embedding from this class, right? And uh, for attribute encoder, there is no choice, I am not using any older uh, word to vec kind of architecture, I am straightforward, uh, I am straightly going towards to uh, SOTA sentence transformers, right? And uh, these are two things. And uh, here I'm leaving a class just in case if you are interested in uh, looking at attributes as uh, tabular data, feel free to use this, uh, another version of attribute encoder. But I'm going with language, right? Those two are uh, attribute encoder uh, for the language part and the vision part for the image, right? You have the choice to use CNN or transformers, right? Next uh, logical section is uh, the facial retrieval data set where we are going to come up with the TARS data set to nicely um, uh, you know, put things together, right? Like the two encoders, you know, how the model is going to read the data and look at it. The main th again here, right? There is, there is nothing earth shattering here. It's pretty straightforward. As you can see from the preview, the images are also center carved. There is not much argumentation required. You, you can try doing some kind of horizontal or vertical flipping, uh, but it is not required in my opinion. Uh, the only thing that I'm doing is resizing into a 224 by 224 image and you can see based on whether it's a CNN or a transformer architecture because hugging face transformers uh, convert uh, you know processes the image slightly differently we have to use a processor but CNN is pretty straightforward right so that's what is happening here the key takeaway for you is the three inputs we are passing the anchor image anchor which is the image the positive attribute and the negative attribute right so uh, now the data set is ready, we are instantiating the data set. You have the external parameter whether you want to instantiate as a CNN or t uh, transformers. And then once that is instantiated, I am just uh, converting that into a data loader for the model to read and uh, train. Uh, important uh, takeaway here is the batch size is crucial. Unlike discriminative tasks, batch size is very, very important, guys. Uh, the higher the batch, uh, any kind of contrast to last, whether it is contrast to triplet or multiple ranking, uh, works better because it's, it, it gets to see multiple different varieties of negatives. Uh, for the hardware I have access to, I could afford to have 128 as a batch size for CNN based models and 64 as a batch size for transformer based models, right? Um, so here is the actual uh, model, uh, which is uh, which is basically a Lego of you know, which is basically a uh, combination of all the Lego pieces which we discussed, the data set, the encoders, and things like that. Right? It's a pretty straightforward thing, guys. Um, the main thing that you want to look at here is this portion, which basically accepts some external parameters to decide whether it has to instantiate the vision encoder as a transformer-based encoder or a CNN-based encoder. That's what is happening here. Uh, and these two layers are the projection layers. Obviously, it is important because we know that um, the embeddings from CNN models typically are very high, like 2048 or things like that. And uh, sentence transformers can be different. So we, uh, the idea is to project both of the uh, embeddings, the text embedding, that is attribute embeddings, as well as the vision embeddings to a uh, same dimension. So we have two layers of vision and text projection, and then we have a dropout to inject some level of um, kind of uh, regularization into the model when learning, right? Uh, the other three important things are, 
the, this is this three lines are important right we mentioned that we can use any kind of uh, loss function as a basis for learning the metric and tweaking the embedding space right you can use euclidean or cosine or any loss for that matter i am using euclidean i am also commenting and leaving the cosine for you if you want to experiment and uh, this is the loss function that we are this is the variant this is the pytorch implementation of triplet loss which i am using which basically externalizes the uh, distance function that you can use there are two versions in pytorch one which does not externalize it so you don't have control over it it, it by default uses uh, um, pairwise distance that is euclidean only um, but you have here you have an option the margin is basically a default well margin is the one which decides how far apart we have to have what kind of distance we want to have between anchor positive and anchor negative right you can have uh, any kind of value it uh, there is no recommend i mean there are recommendations it's better to start with a default value 0.1 and uh, that's pretty much it the forward is pretty straightforward guys what it does is it takes the anchor positive attribute negative attribute that we are passing in the data set which we just saw gets the embedding from the respective encoder normalizes it projects it and applies dropout look at anything for example right look at the positive attribute here we encode it normalize it project it and then we do a dropout that's it we do it for all the three inputs and then we are applying the we are passing it through the last function that is anchor positive negative and the last function is going out that's pretty much the network right and uh, that's that's everything that we wanted to cover and the rest I mean, as far as those are the new things we wanted to cover in contrast to training the next step is uh, in the actual training loop uh, which is pretty standard pytorch turning loop there are a couple of different ways you can actually train uh, contrastive um, uh, for contrastive models i'm going to talk about it in a minute but pretty much uh, um, you know there is not a there is not a lot of change in the training loop itself right so section 8a and 8b will talk about instantiating our uh, face retrieval model in a using transformer as a backbone as well as cnn as a backbone right um the main uh, yeah here you can see those externalized parameters that i spoke about that architecture is transformers model name here we can say the vision dimension text dimension and the projection dimension that is 768 768 and we are projecting it to 512 this is how we are instantiating uh, that our face fetch network as a we're using transformer vision we have a choice right so we are we will we should be able to instantiate the model using two different uh, vision backbones two based on two different uh, architectures for vision backbones right and uh, the main thing that I, that you want to cover here uh, that i want to cover here is that i mentioned right there are a couple of different ways you can train uh, that is, that is actually not a couple of different ways in the training loop itself it's about how you deal with the learning rate scheduler one is to go with the classic linear schedule warm up we used in discriminator task it works all the time uh, there is no change in the optimizer it's adam w's optimizer we are using but learning rate scheduler can be uh, two different things one is what i've used other is reduced learning rate and plateau right uh, the idea is pretty simple guys uh, i want you guys to check out the pytorch official documentation but you, as you can see here uh, the idea is you are trying to learn a metric right the reduce lr and plateau what it says is the metric that you are learning if it stops then basically uh, you can mention the patients how many epochs you want to wait if it plateaued or stopped and then by a factor of whatever number you mention it is going to reduce the learning rate let me repeat reduce lr on plateau is a simple concept which basically is going to monitor a particular value in this case let's say val loss is the loss that we are going to track right uh, we are trying to minimize it and using our optimizer we what is the patient's level one epoch wait for one epoch we are telling basically the scheduler to wait for one epoch if the value has plateaued and if it is not reducing reduce the learning rate by points on this is one way uh, or one recommended way to uh, use the learning rate scheduler you can see in con uh, in the literature for contrastive training right the other way is to use the classic one both works you feel free to experiment and make up your mind guys i just want to leave it out there otherwise these two are the actual training and you can see the loss going on and uh, this is the uh, instantiating how to instantiate with the cnn as a backbone and then the actual training itself right uh, both of the models have been ran for four epochs another important aspect uh, we want to cover here is uh, yeah 
how to track, right? If you look at, if you keep on looking at losses, training loss and val loss are pretty good uh, measure of whether the model is learning something, whether it is tweaking or not. But uh, for if you are starting for the first time, if you want to have an additional hang over how exactly the embedding space is getting tweaked as, as epoch after epoch as the model learns, uh, another general recommendation is to find out how many samples are, are, are correct. What do I mean by that, right? Look at this uh, code snippet. Uh, as we know, the triplet loss is calculating the distance between the anchor and the positive and the anchor and the negative. Uh, just find out if the difference between those is greater than the margin we have set. If it is greater than the margin we have set, just collect the metric, like sum it up, right? And uh, return it along with the loss in the uh, network that we are uh, designed. Like for example, uh, in the network, we are sending only the loss here. Along with the loss, you can also send the actual uh, sum of correct uh, samples that we have collected using this logic. Now, what does that indicate is, as we move forward and we train more samples and more epochs, then the, the value for the correct sample should keep on increasing as the validation loss keep on decreasing. That's another measure that shows that the model is actually tweaking the embedding space and learning something useful. If it is plateaued, it's time for you to apply some kind of early stopping or, you know, Depending on how you are designing your training flow, you can do whatever you want to stop the training process because it's useless, right? Those are uh, that's a pretty useful recommendation. I have not used it, but feel free to try it out. Um, four epochs, yeah. And now that we have uh, the models trained, uh, this is a pretty simple step. I'm just loading the models and I'm um, trying to see two things, right? Uh, we have to see two things. One is do some qualitative analysis because we are in a retrieval task. We want to uh, supply some random queries to see how the model is performing in terms of retrieval. That is a qualitative uh, response results, right? The other thing is we have a test data frame. We also want to see uh, in the entire test data frame how the, the retrieval performance for the model is for uh, query to image or image to query, whichever it is, right? So that's what we want to do, right? So one is a qualitative thing and one is like an actual kind of benchmarking kind of uh, thing, right? So this is the, uh, this portion is the test data set. We are trying to make it as similar as the uh, train and the validation data set we used. We have loaded the model here. Uh, as usual, the test data set is instantiated and we have created a lo data loader for the test data set, right? Um, in this step, it's pretty straightforward, guys. I'm using the model that we trained and loaded just now and then creating the image embeddings for all the images in the test data set. That's all that's happening and this method, get image embedding, returns the names of the images as well as the embeddings of the images for us, right? So I'll tell you why it is required, right? why we are going to do some uh, qualitative tests. What I mean by that is we're going to send some random queries and see how it is retrieving, right? So we have uh, implemented a custom search function which internally uses the search function, uh, which internally uses the utility offered, uh, the cosine uh, distance space utility offered by sentence transformer, right? So the idea here of this search function is to accept a custom query that we will supply and use the embeddings that we have just calculated and then use the query to retrieve the most relevant images from the image embedding. That's what is happening here, guys. Feel free to have a look at it. We are doing using the same text encoder of the model, project it, and then using this is the portion which is actually doing the search for us. And then I'm just plotting it. This portion is basically getting the results and plotting it so that we can review it, right? So section 9A and 9B will be uh, coverage of qualitative results. Um, I'll tell you guys, there are a lot of results for you I have put in. I may not be able to go over everything. There are about 10 different search queries and results are there. Uh, I would rather focus on the test data's, uh, entire test data's performance uh, and how it compares to SOTA models rather than the qualitative results. But I will do some couple of samples here, right? So. Let's look at this, right? This is like a warm-up query. If I passed male attractive, young, brown hair, smiling, wavy hair, right? Look at the look at the grain of the attributes, right? We are giving multiple different attributes for hair and the uh, beard and smiling and these are very, very glandular and the model is able to do justice to the hair color, smiling and the level of hair is five o'clock shadow, not deep uh, beard and things like that. Same query, I've changed the black, brown hair to black hair here. You can see, right, the hair alone changes, right? So I'm just trying to show how the, how uh, fine grained the retrieval is and how good the model is. And you can see the score in the bottom, right? Uh, here is an example for a female gender. And also I have overloaded the, uh, the attributes. If you, I just wanted to see if there are too many, uh, too many attributes, what happens, right? 
the model still is able to do justice in terms of oval face, pointy nose, smiling. I feel free to check it out guys. I, I will not be able to walk through every single attribute and the images. But uh, I, the only takeaway for you is this, the confidence, the similarity score kind of drops down when we add more attributes. So in these results, right, as I have said, there are 10 queries. You are looking at query 1. I have done 10 queries. All these queries, the first result is CNN and the second result is the transformer model, right. Feel free to look at it. Um, there are a bunch of examples I have covered. Here as you can see, right, the model even understands the concept of bangs, blonde hair and here moustache, hair, uh, wearing hat, yeah. Um, another thing in terms of qualitative results what we want to consider is multimodal face retrieval or attribute manipulation, right. Here couple of examples, right. Here, uh, this is the function I have written uh, to accept not only a query, it is image query, operand and text query and then does this basic uh, tensor operation which is nothing but uh, adding or subtracting the image query and the text query to manipulate the attributes of the image and get the results, right. Feel free to go through it except for the inputs and how it is manipulated in this case, uh, everything else is same guys. As you can see, right, look at this image, you accept an image and then you wanted to minus the smiling from it. As you can see, the query image and the result image matches one on one with every aspect except the smile part. It is like almost we have removed the smile from the ladies, right. Um, it is pretty good uh, if you ask me. And here we want to remove banks like the, the attributes of the query image and the result image are again matching except for banks. Um, here um, you know look at a male example where we are passing a, a photograph of a young person we want to subtract the blonde hair. You can look at the results, right? Again, we got a result of young celebrities who are just boys, but instead of blonde hair, they have a different color hair, right? So manipulation also qualitatively works. These are good on paper, but this is not how you uh, evaluate a retrieval model, right? This is not evaluation. These are qualitative results to do some random sampling. Uh, retrieval uh, evaluation measures, there are certain specific matrices and measures for evaluating retrieval models and this diagram gives you, uh, it kind of summarizes all the evaluation measures. As you can see, right, uh, we are looking at the left leg of the diagram that is offline metrics. Why? Because we are not trying to do any online learning. We are trying to develop a system and before deploying it to production, we want to understand as a system how it performs. For that, we want to go offline. In offline, as you can see, right, we are not trying to do Google search where the rank of the results and the order of the result does not matter. So order aware is not our goal. Under offline, we want to go order unaware. Order unaware has got multiple options. We are going with the recall at K instead of the other three options, other two options because for a simple reason that uh, we are trying to compare our models performance with state of the art models in uh, certain papers and they are using recall at K. So it will be meaningful for us to compare only if the metrics are same, right. So I have also in, uh, in this cell, I have linked couple of things. One is a primer for evaluation measures that is from Pinecone. And also the link to the paper called Modality Free Human Identification is Zero Shot Learning which is apparently the state of the art as far as facial recognition is concerned today, uh, multimodal facial recognition is concerned, right. So here is the, uh, the, the paper that I spoke about, here is the, uh, the result table from the paper, right. So our focus is obviously like I said, right, Celebe is very popular, Celebrity uh, A attribute is a very popular data set and they have been using it and uh, our focus is. Uh, I have just included in the green box that is attribute to image and then inside that they have three different numbers that when I say recall at k they wanted to measure recall at three numbers where k is equal to 1, 5 and 10. What does that mean is if we retrieve for a given attribute if we retrieve one image how precise how uh, the recall is if we retrieve five images for a particular attribute how the recall is in terms of retrieval and if you retrieve 10 images what is the percentage and that's the results are shown in percentage the red is the uh, winning number number one uh, and blue is the second rank right so it's all in percentage right so uh, i have just ran uh, for our cnn model and the transformer model the same thing recall at one uh, five and ten and I got the numbers and let's quickly evaluate the i mean let's see the visuals right uh, visually let's see how the number looks right as you can see, uh, where we fit in, in the SOTA table, we are fitting in around the uh, somewhere between 
the second and third and it is a very very modest performance right our model is uh, not really performing great our models both the cnn version and transformer version uh, what could be wrong because the numbers the percentage of recall at one for the highest model is 41 and the second highest model is 21.4 and we are nowhere near it we are in a single digit right what could be wrong what are we missing what have we done wrong uh, if we investigate that uh, the important aspect that we have that you need to notice here is the models that we have used are using vision and text backbones which has no notion of face now what do i mean by that is the resnet 50 and the v80 models that we used as a vision backbone for training with the celibe data set were trained only on imagenet they have no concept of face but if you if you read this paper which i've linked above right the sota paper clearly tells all the all the models they have used are loaded with a face trained pre-trained checkpoints not just some image net or something they know the concept of faces right so now i had to do the same thing so what i wanted to do is i wanted to take the same technique we described in this paper but load the vision backbone if it's cnn a specific face train checkpoint if it is transformer also a specific checkpoint right so if you see the results now the vanilla ImageNet uh, trained uh, ResNet 50D and V80 is obviously modest and it is not so great. But if you look at the IRS 50 and face transformers, which are the face pre-trained checkpoints, which I've loaded as a starting point, because ImageNet is a different uh, starting point for vision. And then the face train, uh, train checkpoints are different starting point. We get a, a good bump in performance. As you can see the numbers, right? the numbers are definitely uh, good. But I'm surprised that without even having any notion of face, that we are able to build uh, models based on ImageNet uh, checkpoints which are doing actually decent is very very surprising for me. So that's the thing and the main takeaway for us, uh, we are able to give a competitive performance as far as the SOTA table is concerned even though we are not able to beat SOTA. Um, at the same time I want you guys to take a moment and appreciate that, uh, that I'm coming up with four models to demonstrate uh, this particular lesson because uh, it's not like four models, right? Every model we have to develop a baseline and then we have to improve it. So it takes a lot more energy to develop actually four models for a single lesson. Uh, I, I hope you guys understand and appreciate that. Um, and as far as uh, you may wonder, right? Where, where did I take the pre-trained checkpoints for the face models for ResNet as well as face transformer? I have included the links here. Uh, the, one of the important things that you that I want you guys to for the want of time and to keep uh, keep it short, uh, I'm not going to cover how to load the checkpoints, pre-trained phase checkpoints, because both the ResNet and the transformer they have used in the respective papers and repo I have shown here, they are not vanilla models. That means the transform phase transformer cannot be directly loaded to a hugging phase transformer. They are custom uh, networks. In an addendum uh, or a subsequent session, I will show you how to take these uh, pre-trained checkpoints for face and load it into the custom networks and train it uh, for face retrieval, right? Um, that's my promise, guys. I'll do it in a subsequent session, probably a video or just simply a notebook, right? Um, yeah, so uh, the important thing is, the as in any machine learning uh, lesson, the idea is not to build the perfect model. The idea is to build a useful model and improve on top of it. The concept of improving retrieval model is called relevance feedback, right? It is to expose the model, the useful model, so results to end users where humans will interact and give some feedbacks, so whether it could be an implicit feedback or explicit feedback. We can factor in and further tweak the embedding space and tweak the metric uh, that we have learned, right? That's the idea. Um, these are some brass tacks. Please feel free to go through references, learning paths, and things like. There are some exercises. Uh, I mean, a lot of you got. I got only two or three responses for the exercises. Feel free to look at it, guys. This will, uh, you know, solidify your participating in this quiz and exercise will solidify your learning, and then you can come up with some interesting questions. Why not do this? And I've also given you some in interesting experiments that you could try on top of this. Um, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover um, in this episode. In terms of closing thoughts, it's pretty straightforward, guys. I've summarized a few things. <laughs> One of the important things is uh, the age-old lesson of uh, CNN is sample efficient when, com when it comes to transformers is reinforced. But transformers' performance is great when the data is more like in Celebi, we have 200K. Um, vanilla vision backbones are surprisingly good for facial recognition. That's my lesson. And then using a pre-trained uh, face pre-trained checkpoint obviously gives a stronger competitor. 
and uh, yeah there are a couple of more points feel free to look at it and brass tacks the link to the notebook will be as usual in the description of the uh, video and answers for all the qu 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 uh, quizzes and exercises will be in the slack channel feel free to drop in and check it out and i will uh, as usual pick one or two people to send some laptop st uh, laptop stickers uh, that's uh, pretty much what i wanted to cover guys and uh, um, um, thanks for your time and feel free to ask questions in the slack channel cheers